Hi, everybody. Hi, this is Greg Wong, and uh, we just want to thank you for joining us today. Um, and we're going to talk about how to choose the right heatsink attachments for uh, component packages of all sizes and shapes. So today, uh, we'll briefly talk, uh, review, you know, what is a heatsink, um, and then we'll go into what is a heatsink attachment. Um, what are the most common uh, attachments that we see and, and how they work? And then we're going to talk about um, system on chip and system in package, uh, which we're seeing more and more of. You know, is is this a special case? You know, are there any special requirements that that we need to consider here? Um, and then at the end, we're going to talk about why why we need springs at all. Why why do we see springs so often uh, on these heat sink attachments? Um, and then at the end, we'll open up to a question and answer session, so um, you know we can get some of your questions answered. So first of all, to review, you know, we're, we're talking about heat sinks here. What is a heat sink, right? So a heat sink is a heat dissipation device and usually has a base and extended surfaces, you know, that we call, that we normally call fins. And the purpose of this is uh, to bring the heat from a component, you know, conduct it through the heat sink and then transfer it um, into the ambient air. That's uh, generally what we're doing with the heat sink. The thermal performance of the heat sink uh, is effect affected by factors such as air velocity, uh, choice of heat sink material. You know, the most common ones we see are aluminum and copper. Uh, the thermal performance is also affected by the surface treatment, like a anodizing or, or no finish or, or um, something like that. The performance is also impacted, of course, by, um, you know, the application. You know, is it in open air, you know, or is it in a ducted flow where you might have a fan blowing right through the, the heat sink. You know, so there are a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, and next month um, we're gonna have a webinar on heat sink design and selection. And we'll talking we'll be talking more about that uh, in detail, you know, like how to choose a heat sink um, and, and all the factors that uh, affect the thermal performance. So now that we've recapped heat sinks. So what are heat sink attachments? So the heat sink attachment is any mechanical method that we use to attach the heat sink um, to the heat generating component um, and, and, you know, and, and hopefully it provides good contact to create a good um, heat transfer between the component and the heat sink. So ideally, there shouldn't be any air gaps between the heat source and the bottom of the heat sink because air, as we know, air doesn't conduct heat well. Um, so you almost always we use some kind of thermal interface material, um, which we call TIM for short, uh, and that can that usually fills up any irregularities in the surfaces and uh, gets rid of it, uh, any air gaps. Um, so typical interface materials would include thermal grease, phase change material, um, gap pads are very common. Um, and the thermally conductive adhesive tape is also uh, a popular uh, TIM. So heat sink attachment also ensures that the heat sink stays mechanically connected to the heat source, uh, which is uh, important to pass shock and vibe requirements, uh, and also just in a lot of applications like automotive and or anything where you have a system moving around, you want to keep the heat sink in place, right? Or else it's not going to do its job. Um, so we're going to look at some of the most common heat sink attachment methods here, and uh, we'll talk briefly about some of the um, pros and cons of, of each one. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have thermal thermal tape. Uh, the the long name for this would be thermally conductive adhesive or double sided adhesive tape. Um, so we this is a very common uh, attachment method. Uh, because uh, it's easy to use, you know, it's it's a material that um, the heat sink manufacturer can apply to the heat sink. So when the assembler gets it, they only need to re remove a liner and apply it to the component. Um, so it's inexpensive. Um, some of the cons, though, are that the thermal conductivity, the, the heat transfer of this material is on the low to moderate side compared to something like thermal grease. 
Um, it also doesn't perform well with, with really heavy heat sinks. Um, and the, well, the surfaces do need to be cleaned um, for the best adhesion. So thermal epoxy um, is also pretty inexpensive. Uh, there is a, um, so the advantage that epoxy has over thermal tape is that the adhesion tends to be better uh, because uh, epoxy you know, has good adhesion. Um, some of the cons though with, with epoxy are because that adhesion is so good, that rework of the heat sink and the component can be very difficult, if not impossible, uh, to carry out. Um, uh, and then there is an additional cost because you, you may need sp uh, special application tools to apply the epoxy, and there's also generally a cure time associated with epoxy. So another attachment method we, we see often are Z-clips, which are usually formed from some kind of wire and bent in, the, in a, some kind of shape, often like a, a Z. Um, now, the, the, some of the best advantages about this is that it's reworkable. You can usually unhook the clip and then take this off and then the heat sink can be removed. Um, but one of the best things is that because this is a separate attachment, the interface material now doesn't need to attach the heat sink. So you can use something like a thermal grease or a phase change material that, that has much higher thermal performance compared to uh, thermal tape. Uh, because thermal tape and epoxy are both doing double duty. You know, they're, they're attaching the heat sink as well as providing the uh, heat transfer path. Um, whereas when you start using a Z clip or some kind of spring clip, uh, you can use a thermal a tim that that uh, has much better thermal performance. Uh, disadvantages of using a Z clip is that you need to have some anchors uh, that get attached to your PCB. Um, so typically there will be some through holes in the PCB, and you'll need to solder an anchor into the board. Um, and then um, the and then typically they are custom designs as well. Um, there are, there are a few that are off the shelf z clips but um more often than not it, it's uh, it's custom in order to reach um the anchor points um so clip on attachments are are also a very popular option you know uh ats we have a couple of different uh, methods available we call them our maxi grip and our super grip um great advantage of the clips like the like the Z clips, you know that it provides a constant preload force on the component, um, which allows you to use that high performance uh, tim. Um, clips don't require any holes in your PCB, although it does need a, a small keep out zone around the component uh, in order for this plastic frame clip um, to to sit. Um, clips are also the uh, advantage of clips are also that it's easy to remove and, and do rework on the heat sink. Um, and then a con may be that there, there may be some extra assembly steps. Like first you have to install the plastic frame clip, and then you put the heat sink in place, and then you install the, the spring clip. And we'll actually show a, a video uh, in a few moments um, to show actually how, you know, that it's, it's a pretty easy process. Uh, and just to note that generally the, the, cost of these attachments uh, is tending to increase like thermal tape is usually the least expensive and we're getting um, you know the price is increasing a little bit as we as we go up uh, with these different methods oh there's a bird out there so next we have uh, push pin and compression springs um, so a great advantage of, of these push pins and springs is that we can start getting creating higher and higher preload forces on the, on the component and the TIM, which is great for uh, the heat transfer. And also it allows us to start using larger heat sinks uh, because we can be a little bit more mechanical, mechanically secure. Uh, push pins again, um, they can, they're easy to install. Um, you know, you just push this pin through, the, through a hole in the circuit board uh, and they're easy to rework because that can be removed as well. Uh, but a con is that you do need to have holes 
in your circuit board, you know, and with the push pin heat sink, generally that's two or four uh, holes in, in your board. And then lastly, um, for customers who are, or applications where you're very concerned about um, mechanical security, we generally recommend uh, threaded standoff uh, and screw attachment with a compression or with a coil spring. Um, so this this can achieve the highest levels of, of preload. Um, you know, often in a computer uh, computer CPU, you know, you may see you know hundred hundred pounds of force being applied by the attachments or or more easily more. And these will give great um, results with as far as heat transfer at the TIM. Um, and the, and because it's so mechanically secure, um, it's excellent for for large heat sink, large heavy heat sinks, and you know to make sure that they're they're you know they don't come loose. Um, disadvantages again are that it does require a hole in the PCB, you know, for the screw to go through, or uh, you may have you may need to have a, a threaded insert pressed into the circuit board as shown here, you know, or in the case of computer motherboards, you know, a lot often the CPU is in some kind of a socket, a frame like that, um, and the heatsink will attach to that socket. Um, so that assembly may be a little bit more, which adds to the cost, you know, because you have more elements, you, you may have the uh, one or two screws, a standoff and a spring. So that's what adds to the cost. Also, um, we like to, to say these are these technically these are all mechanical attachments you know even the thermal tape but in familiar terms um, we usually call you know any kind of clip mechanism or, or hardware attachment we call these mechanical attachments and these allow you to use that you know thermal grease and uh, and a phase change material um, so we usually call these mechanical attachments and then these um, Typically, you know, we call them, we just call it thermal tape or, or epoxy. So here we'll, we'll show a short demo video of uh, how to use the thermal tape and you can see uh, how easy it is to use and, and some recommended application steps um, to apply that. So the first step is to make sure that all your surfaces are clean. You wanna make sure that there are no residue from previous TIMs on there. So you can just use uh, some alcohol and a lint-free cloth of some kind and just make sure your surfaces are spotless. So we're going to use a thermal tape. Now this tape is a Comerix uh, product and it's uh, and you can cut it with scissors or an X-Acto knife. And you just take it off the backing and you center it on your heat sink or wherever the component is and press it down firmly and make sure you get all the air bubbles out because air doesn't conduct heat well as you know. Then when you're ready you just take off the backing on this side and uh, when you buy a lot of the heat sinks from the VIPS thermal solutions they will already have the TIM apply it and you just put it right down on the component. Uh, so one thing to note is that um, there is typically some kind of required application pressure with the, with the thermal tape, um, because most of these adhesives are called pressure sensitive adhesives, right? And they require a certain amount of pressure and, and time uh, in order to activate the adhesive. Um, so for the best guidelines on that though, then you would refer to the data sheets um, uh, provided by the by the uh, thermal tape manufacturers. And you know, and, and if you buy a heat sink and you're not sure what the thermal tape is on there, you know, we can we can help you figure that out, and we can help you um, find the appropriate data sheets that'll that'll give those application guidelines. But the but the pressure uh, is is important to make sure that you know the proper bond is is created. So uh, next, we're, we have a few slides that sh uh, show thermal epoxy. Um, you know, a lot of you are probably familiar with using epoxies to repair things around the house, and we know they have really good adhesion to a lot of different surfaces. 
Now, thermal epoxies are based on the same, same epoxies, but they have fillers to increase the thermal conductivity of the material. Um, uh, so the thermal conductivity of the epoxy may range from anywhere from one to six watts per meters K. Um, and, but typically, the thermal performance is still not going to be quite as good as a thermal grease or something like that, uh, because you'll, you'll be able to achieve a thinner bond line with thermal grease. Um, so typically, typically, when you apply the thermal epoxy, uh, first you'll need to either mix it, or if you have mixing nozzles like this, uh, then it'll, it'll get mixed in the nozzle. Um, and then first, you generally squeeze a little bit out um, and, and you just discard it you know, to make sure that it's mixing well. And then you apply a thin layer um, uh, onto the surface of the heat source. And then, and then you apply the heat sink down onto the surface uh, of the component. Uh, you, can, you can apply the epoxy you know, from that applicator or, or you can use uh, some kind of a spreader um, to, to put a thin layer of, of epoxy there. Um, so in the application, you, you will want to put some kind of pressure on, onto, the, onto the heat sink to ensure a solid bond. Um, and again, uh, epoxy does need curing time, uh, which can be accelerated by heat. Um, so you'll need to refer to the data sheets to to know you know how much time is is required before you know the boards can be uh, put into service or before you know you can continue assembly on your boards. Another thing is the application pattern of of the epoxy. You know we we've read a lot of different things. You know of star patterns or you know a pattern of lines or just put a dot in the center and put the heat sink on top of it. Um, now we would, we would just recommend, you know, if, if you have any questions, you know, about that particular aspect of epoxy, that probably the best resource would be to, to uh, contact the uh, the TIM manufacturers or or may have guidance on on the data sheets. Um, so moving on to the clip type attachment, we have a short video here that uh, demonstrates the use of, of our, our uh, super grip attachment. Supergrip installs quickly and easily. The frame clip goes around the component and snaps in place. This frame clip has wedges on all four sides that keep it secured on the component. It's important to place the clip so that the horseshoe tabs are in line with the direction of the airflow. A heatsink is placed onto the frame clip and then the spring clip is put into place through the heatsink's fin field. When you hear a click, it lets you know that the spring clip is now in the correct position. As the stainless steel spring clip pulls up on the horseshoe, it actually pulls it tighter into the component. The horseshoe contracts and pulls the frame clip tight around the BGA on all four sides, and that ensures a strong mechanical bond between the heat sink and the component. So we do, uh, from time to time, have questions uh, from customers about, you know, that, that uh, the, frame, the frame clip on here, it attaches underneath the BGA. And customers sometimes have questions about, you know, uh, is it possible that it's going to damage the BGA, or will it tend to lift the component away from the, the board, you know, also damaging the, the BGA? Uh, and the answer to that is the, the forces that the frame clip apply to the component are very low, and, and we have literally hundreds of thousands of these, like in the field, um, with, with no failures that are attributed to, um, you know, uh, failure of the of the BGA, uh, you know, because because of these mechanical causes. So we have a really good reliability record uh, for this for our uh, clip-on attachments, both the maxi grip and the super grip. Um, so we also have a short demo here of of how to use uh, how to install heat sink with the push pin attachment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so. Pushpin heat sinks will typically either have four holes like, you know, at all four corners, or you may see them with with two holes that that are typically diagonal across the heat sink. Although we have made some custom applications where they're straight across the heat sink. Pushpin heat sinks have integral holes that align with standard PCB locations. The locations of the holes in the heat sink will determine where holes must be drilled into the board. Industry standards for these locations are readily available from board designers or from ATS. 
The required hole diameter for all ATS pushpins is 3.175 millimeters. Each pushpin has a flexible barb at its installation end that engages with the bottom of the hole in the PCB. Once installed, the barb securely retains the pin. The compression springs hold the assembly together and maintain contact between the heatsink and components. Align the heatsink with the holes in the board. With one hand on the heatsink for stability, press the pins through the board one at a time with your other hand. If using more than two push pins, install the pins in a crisscross orientation. For removal, push the barbs together and pull up on the pin. So next, uh, we're going to talk about rectangular packages now because um, you know we we've seen a, a rise of, of the use of system in package or system on chip. Um, and a lot of times these packages are rectangular instead of the traditional square BGAs um, that, that we've been working a lot with. Um, so how, when we're going about designing attachment systems for these, how, how do we attach heatsink to this? Well, well, typically, you know, any method that we use to attach heatsinks to square components can be used here. Um, but one of the exceptions to that is, is the clip-on attachments. Uh, because traditionally, you know, we, we've had square uh, attachments, and and so obviously they're not going to fit on a rectangular package. And then another challenge is that often these rectangular components are larger than than a lot of the square components that we've seen. Uh, but we found through um, FEA simulations and uh, lab testing that the engineering plastic that we use uh, in our existing super grips and, and maxi grips, that that plastic is actually strong enough uh, and enabled us to design larger rectangular frame clips um, without sacrificing an, any strength or reliability. Um, and, and the keep out area that, that we have is still, is still very minimal. Um, so as, as such, we've, we've expanded our, our line of super grip clip-on attachments to address this increasing use of rectangular BGA packages. Um, so uh, pretty soon on our website, you'll, you'll see those different sizes that we have available for um, rectangular packages. Um, so you'll notice that in most of these attachments, you know, aside from the thermal tape and the epoxy, um, they all have springs, right? And and you may be asking, you know, why do we need springs at all? And and that's just because you know all heat sinks and components have manufacturing tolerances, right? I mean, a, a component may have a nominal height, uh, but there's always a tolerance given on the data sheet. And in the real world, when you get these components on your board, you know, the height uh, is always going to be a little more or a little less, you know. Um, and then the springs, um, they adjust for these changing tolerances. And they also apply constant force on the component and the thermal interface material, you know, to, to keep that um, the heat transfer, uh, um, you know, have good performance of the TIM. Um, so, in in some cases though you know there may be applications where we will not use a spring and instead we we would uh, mount um in this case it's a heat spreader plate uh, because you can see the heat pipe coming off of here but this is actually a plate that gets mounted directly to a pcb so it has four raised mounting points here uh, the ones right off the picture um, and then screws go through the pcb and, and thread into the plate. So this plate mounts directly to the PCB and we call this hard mounting, uh, no springs. So a lot of times, um, you know, the hard mounting is saved for special applications. In, in this case, we have several components that this plate covers. Um, you know, you can see pockets uh, for, for the different components and you can also see little, little etched areas, little etched lines here that got, helped guide us uh, put um, gap pads onto, onto this plate. Um, when you have hard mounting, then you will need to use some kind of thermal interface material that uh, conforms to the different tolerances because you no longer have the springs to adjust the height. So you're gonna need to use something like a gap pad or a gel material 
you know that that's soft and and can conform to to the different heights um and so one of the reasons why um you would want a hard mount onto multiple components is because if you're using springs to mount uh this this heat plate then on on one assembly one component may be higher and on, on another assembly another component may be higher and it's always going to change the balance of, of the pressure among these different components when you have the different components um, you know with different um, manufacturing tolerances so whereas if you have when you're hard mounting the plate um, the plate's always going to be in the same place um, you know within manufacturing tolerances but the plates the plate will always be in the same place and you'll be able to design certain pressures into each one by using um, either different pocket depths or using different thicknesses of, of gap pad. But the pressure will be consistent among uh, all the various components, which is a great advantage um, to, to the hard mounting. There's a little bit more design involved because you have to figure out how much, uh, how much tolerance, how much uh, mounting distance you're giving to each component and how much you're gonna compress each gap pad. You know, and you also have to keep manufacturing tolerances tight, like for the distance between this this uh, surface here and the mounting surface. You know, you, you need to control that tolerance uh, really well, um, so that you don't have you don't create an air gap, and you don't crash into the component as well. Um, so that's that's it for for heat sink attachments. And just thank, thanks for attending our webinar. And now we're just going to open it up to uh, your questions. Eric, thanks so much. That was a great presentation. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. And we do have a few questions. I'll just bring them up one at a time, Greg. Um, one of the first ones is, have you had any experience with nanoparticle-based thermal grease? And does it, does it actually give better heat transfer, do you know? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think typically most of the thermal greases that we use could be considered nanoparticle thermal grease because the th fillers that they, that they use are typically extremely small. Um, and as we mentioned uh, in the epoxy slide, you know, it may be things like alumina, which are which which is aluminum oxide, beryllia, which is beryllium oxide. Uh, but these fillers are uh, you know they're they're what make the grease work really i mean um because the greases are a lot often silicone based and the the grease itself doesn't have great thermal conductivity so it's the fillers that are really doing all the work another question is do plastic frame frame clips pose a fuel risk if there is a fire in the system uh so um, our frame clips are, you know, made from specific engineering polymers that uh, pass the UL uh, ULV94, you know, specifications for flame resistance. Um, and we actually have great videos, uh, a great video on YouTube of us, you know, holding a, a, a blowtorch up to one of our attachments, um, and the the heat sink stays secure even with even with the plastic frame clip being exposed to that flame, um, the heat sink stays secure and uh, and we, we're not adding fuel um, to this assembly, which is, you know, a big, a big requirement in a lot of uh, telecom applications. Uh, another question is, do push pins pose any kind of potential risk for electrical shorting or EMI transmission or amplification, do you know? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure about the EMI aspect of it, um, or you know, or sometimes high voltage things come into play as well. But we're not really experts in that. But um, as far as uh, shorting, um, you you would have to make sure that you have space at the back of your board. You know where the barb comes through. You know you need to make sure that that barb is not going to contact another board behind it or, or other kind of component like that. Um, and then also um, the mounting hole that's in the circuit board, you will need to create, uh, you will need to have some kind of, um, you know, keep out area around that hole um, so that the barbs 
you know, don't uh, contact any, any traces or anything like that uh, when the bar goes through the hole and, and expands. Um, and then just, just to note, you know, typically, you know, for, for push pins, um, we recommend that the holes be uh, copper plated through holes. You know, it, it uh, adds to the mechanical stability of that hole and it, it makes it easier to install the push pin and it's more secure. You know, there's less risk of that push pin, like um, ero kind of eroding the fiberglass of the board, I guess. You know, if you're, if you're pushing it in, it could scratch the fiberglass. So if you plate that hole, it's going to work better. Uh, another question is, are there any use cases where you might combine these attachment methods? Uh, the questioner asked about, like, say, tape and another method. It's possible. I mean, most of the times we don't because, because the advantages of, of that me separate mechanical attachment um, is that we're able to use a higher performance uh, interface material, you know, relative to a tape. Um, but, you know, sometimes if you want to use a clip-on attachment and you want to use a larger heat sink, like you kind of want to stretch the, um, you know, the abilities of the, of the clip attachment, then you may want to couple that with the thermal tape just for, just for extra insurance. Another question is regarding your compression springs, what is the spring's constant tolerance? In other words, how much can one expect the applied force to vary? Uh, well, you know, compression springs are, you know, generally linear within, you know, most of the range. Um, but that's a design, that's a design consideration. You know, when, when we're designing um, the attachment hardware for a certain application, you know, we'll look at how thick the PCB is, how tall the component is, how, how thick the heat sink base is, you know, and we'll select hardware um, that gives, you know, enough play so that you'll never um, get to the solid length of the spring, you know, and, and we'll select the right spring so that you're in the middle of the travel um, you know, so that the spring can work and, and uh, accommodate the, the manufacturing tolerances up and down, um, you know, but, but that is something that you need to pay attention to uh, in the design process, you know, so that you don't end up with a spring that's too long, that, that you end up, you know, getting to solid length because then, then your force just goes up, you know, um, uh, dramatically, right? Uh, and then another thing to note is that, um, on our website, we actually have a hardware selector for our pushpin heat sinks. Um, so this is, uh, once you've found one of our pushpin heat sinks by size, then, then, it go, then it takes you, our selector takes you through a process where you enter things like the PCB thickness and the desired mounting pressure and the component size, and, and we'll give you recommended combinations of pushpins and springs. Um, that will both achieve your, your desired mounting pressure and it will also maintain um, that, that ability to adjust for tolerances. Another question, relative to push pin integration, what is the necessary pressure to insert the pin in the opposite hole? This pressure should be uh, you know, transferred to the component on the PCB. So it's kind of, uh, is that clear, Greg? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, yeah, when, when you put in the, the push pins, the heat sink does tend to, uh, tilt, right? Um, so we generally recommend, you know, applying some, some force to the heat sink to keep it flat during that process. Um, uh, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> A follow-on question was that is for clip-on solutions, what is the maximum level of resistance for vibration and acceleration in terms of accidental dismounting? Um, well, our super grip and maxi grip, uh, the attachments when, when used with the um, um, standard uh, heat sinks, you know, we, uh, through in our catalog, we have, you know, certain heat sinks that come bundled with the uh, with the with the um, super grip attachment, 
And so for those assemblies, for that heat sink and attachment assembly, um, you know, we, we've passed uh, the, the major telecom requirements as far as um, drop, you know, requirements and the shock and vibe requirements um, for things like NEBS and Telcordia and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so if you're talking about our standard um, off-the-shelf products, um, they do comply and they do pass those requirements. Um, in, in a custom application where you might be trying to use that clip with a larger heatsink or, or something like that, um, then you would want to conduct your own shock and vibe testing to make sure that uh, it meets your requirements. Another question, is hard mounting an issue if used to mount both PCB and heatsink together onto a product? In other words, if the PCB and heatsink are both being mounted together uh, using the alignment holes for the heatsink? Um, no, I mean, it, it's not a problem, but you, you would need to use um, the right thermal interface material um, so that you're not uh, so, so that um, you're not applying excessive amounts of pressure to the to the heat generating portions. Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of it. I mean, it, it comes down to the selection of of gap pads or gel or something like that, uh, because if you're using a grease and and you hard mount a component, you know, you could end up basically applying so much force that that you know until your board just bends around the component greg thank you very much that was excellent um if there's no other questions thanks everybody for attending we'll see you next month yeah, thanks, thank greg. you everybody